you're probably wondering what is inside this box. Well, if you're wondering this, and obviously you don't know how to read video titles. So I'll just go ahead and show you. Here we go. Ooh. What we have here is a 1949-ish, I say ish because that's really just a rough estimate, uh, Revere model P90 8mm projector with a 900 watt lamp. This is a very cool little unit. I love the way it looks. It is so awesome. And the uh, story is, I was at the infamous landfill, and I was actually not really looking for anything. I was dropping off some junk, and there was a guy who pulled up in a van, and he had this thing in, in his hand. I'm like, what might that be? <laughs> well, his response was, it's a projector that's all messed up and doesn't work. I'm like, okay. Might I have it? And he said, absolutely. So he handed it to me. I didn't even bother to look into, look into it. I just threw it in my car and took off. Um, <clears throat> so later on, I, I uh, as I was leaving work, I uh, took it out of the container and brought it inside. I discovered a few things that were wrong with it, but hardly all messed up. Um, the power connector here, this this uh, chrome ring, the screws were falling out. Like there was nothing holding the screws in. So I took it apart and I put the, uh, the, the nuts were still inside the base and I, I reattached those, tightened that up. And I slowly realized that that is a, a theme with this projector. Every screw on this projector was loose. So I tightened everything up and I got her going. Um, I found that this shaft here was severely bent. I was able to straighten that out without breaking it. And uh, the rest is history. So what we're going to do is we're going to see it run. Here's the motor and lamp uh, power switch. We'll turn the motor on. There's a cooling fan in here in the back. But uh, it appears to me that the motor basically stops right here, and this is where the blower begins. So we're going to oil the motor, oil ports. You do it while it's running. It's hard to hear a difference in the sound. Now I'm using 3-in-1 in, in the blue can. This is designed for low power fractional horsepower motors. The wear and tear of this thing is, is, is almost non-existent. These paint chips were caused because... Whoa. I'm getting electrocuted. Well, that ain't right. Interesting. Well, apparently, by standing on the floor, that's enough for me to get shocked. Who'd have thunk it? So let's see if that sounds any better. Not too bad. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is engage the clutch, and we're going to hear the unit run before the oil um, is added. Now we're going to add oil. And we're going to start the unit. I'm noticing it's a little bit quieter, a little smoother. Okay, this thing is, uh, has been used. And it is also quite bent, as you can clearly see. We're going to just slide it on there. Just clips in place.
Now I'm going to show you inside the chain drive boxes. It's actually kind of neat how they did this. Okay, here we have the uh, spindle drive assembly, which is very ornate and uh, very cool. Um, I've never owned a projector before. It's all chain driven. Um, here's the automatic tensioner, and uh, here is the. Uh, it's actually not a gear reduction, but it increases the the gear ratio. Uh, bigger gear driving a smaller gear. Um, let's see it in action. Turn the motor down. Clutch on. And I'm going to add some oil to the chain, I think. I don't know if it's necessary or even recommended, but I'm going to oil the chain. I'm going to oil the, um, you know, this little tensioner. I'm glad I removed the lower cover because this lower tensioner is completely frozen solid. Or was. So now I've got to take that apart and uh, lubricate it. Um, it looks like a continuous chain. Actually, it's not. There are two separate chains. And this one, the lower one, is coated with a grease or oil. And um, other than that, everything looks pretty clean. Well lubricated. Well, the verdict on this is, is the following. I'm going to disassemble the drive unit completely. I'm going to wash out all the old grease. I'm going to relubricate everything properly and get her going like she did 60 years ago. Now we're going to remove the massive light bulb. This is a 7... Sorry, a 500 watt bulb, even though the data plate says 900, whatever. Um, Sylvania bulb, which uh, may have in fact been manufactured right near here. There are two Sylvania manufacturing plants that have been there since, one, is, one at least since the 1940s, and another one since at least the 1970s, uh, located within driving distance of my house. So you got to be very careful, but it's a push down and turn style. And there it is. We want to preserve this bulb very carefully. Now there's something rattling around inside. It has probably been there since manufacture. It's uh, not really of concern to me. Um, this is kind of cool. Here's the bulb socket, manufactured by the American Phenolic Corporation, <laughs> better known as Amphenol. Uh, but yes, they changed their name, apparently, over the years, and they are now known as Amphenol. Pretty cool. All right, I removed the motor speed switch. Here it is. Check that out. Is that archaic or what? Basically... I believe that is a carbon style switch, rotary switch. Um, has its lowest point of resistance at this point and gradually reduces all the way down to this point. Made entirely of ceramic. This switch probably weighs a good half a pound. All right, maybe I'm exaggerating just a little. I am going to try to find a suitable touch-up paint for this. I might have to go with a nail polish, to be honest with you. And um, 
because this is such a hard paint to find. Nothing made today is this color, but there are nail polishes that are this color, so I might have to do that. I'm going to actually bring this assembly to a CVS pharmacy and try to color match this to a nail polish. I can't wait. Alright, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Um, here, I've got the blower assembly out. And there's the housing. You see there's a second fan, which cools the motor specifically. The large blower fan obviously cools the light bulb. Pretty simple. And it blows by directing air under through here. As you can see the direction of airflow and it forces it around the bulb socket and up. Okay, here is the very simple shutter assembly. It's that big black rotating disc with a slot in the, in the middle there, or the several slots in it. And as this rotates, it rotates the shutter. That's why it's a relatively silent shutter. Um, it doesn't open and close like per se, like that, it just rotates. So. We're now going to disassemble the motor entirely and um, detach it from the frame. All right, the unit is now completely disassembled and, uh, well, as far as I'm going to go, pretty much. You can now see the entire drivetrain or uh, drive assembly. What we have here is the center drive shaft, which drives the worm gear in addition to the, the shutter. You have, here's the motor and the drive gear, here's the, the uh, motor shaft which drives a reduction um, gear here, which then drives this fiber gear, which drives the main shaft. This is a friction drive that is spring-loaded. Yep, spring-loaded. It's designed so that if the unit were ever to jam up, it would, of course, freeze. And you'll notice, now this is really cool. See all these um, these little felt strips? They're, they go all over the place. And what they do is they connect to each oil port. Now this is some good quality, old-fashioned American engineering here. You've got these little felt strips going to all the different points where lubrication is required. And they link all the way up into a common area, an oil port. You'll also notice this little piece of metal here is designed to prevent that little felt strip from falling into the gear. Here's the, the uh, There's two chains that drive the upper and lower spindles, each with their own tensioner. Um, you've got, all the gearing is brass, which is why lubrication is extremely important. You do not want to starve them for oil, they will wear down quickly. But all the bearings are nice and tight, just the way you want them. A dizzying array of parts I have here scattered on my counter. Jesus. Well, I wanted to show you a couple of little things, um, how certain features of the projector actually work. The first thing I'm going to show you is the, we'll call it a gear selector. Uh, when you switch this um, knob, this lever here, the rewind take-up lever, it switches power from one reel to the other. And it's actually quite simple in how it works. There is a double eccentric shaft here meaning there's one lobe going one way, one lobe going the other. It's basically a, a camshaft. And that knob, or that lever, turns the shaft. Now each gear, each drive gear, is on a different lobe. One lobe goes up, the other one goes down, vice versa. Now the chains ride on independent gears. There's the... Excuse me, here's the upper and the lower runs on the inner gear. When you turn the shaft, okay, one direction, 
the upper gear contacts this drive gear. This is the primary drive gear. And when you turn it the other way, the other gear touches. So it changes the drive gear from one to the other. I'll do that again. Okay, now we are driving the the upper shaft and now we're driving the lower shaft. Pretty cool, huh? The other thing I want to show you is the film advancement device. This is it. This is all it uses to advance the film one frame to another. And how it works is this little uh, this little picker here in the end, oops, that thing, what it does is it, f it moves the film up, or actually it would actually go down one frame as it clicks into the hole of the film, the, the tracking hole, tr and then it moves in, up, out, down, like that. In fact, that is the mechanism that makes the noise that you hear or that you associate with a film projector, not the shutter. It's the film advancement device or rod. And it does that by rubbing up against these two gears. This gear, or this wheel, pushes it out. There's actually a, 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 an eccentric on this washer. It rides along this washer, which pushes it out, and in and out, in and out. And this gear moves it up and down, up and down, just like that. Well, it's beginning to look like a projector again. I'm going to show you how that little, this whole mechanism works here. Um, as you already saw, that little shaft or rod, whatever, moves in and out, up and down. And I'm going to demonstrate it in action here by turning the the uh, shutter wheel or shutter knob on the other side. out of the way. This is the light dowsing filter. Okay. The whole job of this is to prevent too much light from shining through as the projector is in the idle position. So if you shut it off with the light on and the motor running to keep the light bulb cool, you cannot run this projector with the motor off. Um, it won't allow that. So what this does is when it's sitting idle and there's film loaded, this little device here traps a good portion of light from shining through and burning your film. And of course when you set the clutch to on, this little thing is forced out of the way and uh, projection projecting will commence. So we're gonna get this out of there for a second. So as we rotate the shutter, that damn thing. There we go. Oops, forget it. it. Moves in and out, in and out, up and down, advancing the film one frame at a time. All right, the basic um, shutter and advancement assembly is put together. Um, so now this is all working nice and smoothly. I found a couple of adjustments I needed to make with this eccentric cam and we've got the, um, the frame adjustment that I wanted to play with. And what that does is it basically adjusts the height at which the, um, the film stops. So I'll adjust the framing wheel here all right, there we go. And it adjusts the height of the frame, that's all.